say thank you all for being here today. Uh, my name is Maya Tolstoy, and I recently joined this community as the Maggie Walker Dean of the College of the Environment. I want to thank you all for being so welcoming to me as I have uh, transitioned into this new role, and I really look forward to getting to know more of you today and in the months to come. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on the land of the Coast Salish peoples, which touches the shared waters of all the tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. I also acknowledge and honor the tribal nations across Washington State and the many indigenous peoples from across the country who also live and work in Seattle and the surrounding areas. By doing so, I affirm tribal sovereignty. Before we get into the discussion of our diversity, equity, inclusion, and task force report to the community, I'd like to say a few words about what the report is, why it was commissioned, and how we hope to use it as we move forward. As I know many of you are already well aware, the college has a lot of work to do uh, on the DEI front. And I think that term can sometimes uh, be used to avoid saying things that are uncomfortable. So I want to be a little more explicit about what that means. It means that our students, postdocs, researchers, faculty, and staff are not as diverse as our broader community, both regionally and nationally. It means that people from underrepresented groups are often made to feel uncomfortable in the classroom and in the workplace. It means that our physical spaces and operational practices are not all accessible to everyone in the community. And it means that we're not doing enough as a college to develop a culture that makes people feel welcome, regardless of their identity. These challenges are true of many institutions, especially in the sciences. I say that not to absolve us of our responsibilities to do better, but because I think we have an opportunity to chart a better course and set an example for our peers. Ultimately, the goal here is to make the academy and the scholarly work we do fundamentally better Inclusion is also about ideas and culture that people bring to the table. This room, uh, both physically and virtually, is full of people who are passionate about making our college a better, more equitable place. The task, force, task Force's report, which my colleagues will discuss in more detail shortly, was commissioned to assess our current efforts to that effect and to offer us recommendations and templates for improvement and a baseline from which to gauge further progress. These changes will require hard work from everyone in our community, and we have to ensure that that work doesn't fall disproportionately on those who already bear the brunt of discrimination, microaggressions, and inaccessibility. It will also require open and sometimes uncomfortable dialogue, which I hope we can begin today. I'm fortunate to be joined by Luann Thompson, professor Professor of Oceanography, and Russell Callender, Director of Washington Sea Grant, uh, who served as co-chairs of the task force. I'd like to thank them and the other members of the task force for all their hard work on this, um, including Ashley Abrantes, Tim Billow, Mary Dwyer, Brian Harvey, Randall Jones, Jennifer Liu, John Meyer, Jacqueline Padilla-Camino, uh, Fang Zen Tang. I'm grateful that we will be hearing also from Vice President Ricky Hall, the university's Vice President for Minority Affairs and Diversity, about how our next steps can fit into the university's broader DEI efforts. Following their remarks, we'll have a brief panel discussion, after which we'll take questions from the audience, as well as answering questions that we've already received. If you'd like to submit a question, please fill out a comment card and pass it along to the end of your row. For those joining us online, you can submit questions via the link in the video stream's description on YouTube, and also you'll find the link in the email invitation to this event. We'll do our best to answer as many as we can in the time allotted, but if we don't get to yours, I want to emphasize my door is always open, and I'm very happy to discuss these issues with anyone who would like to. These are vast and complex topics, 
and we couldn't possibly cover them fully in a single hour today. Um, we'll be revisiting them regularly in the coming months and years. We'll also be keeping uh, a file of all the questions that were received, uh, both for me to look through after the event, but also to provide to the uh, Associate Dean for DEI when they are hired, so that they can get a snapshot, really, as a background um, of what your concerns are today at this event. Um, now I would like to uh, hand it over to Luann and Russell, who will share more details about the report. Thank you, Dean Tolstoy, and good morning to everybody. I appreciate folks taking the time out of your schedules to join us, either here or virtually. Uh, as uh, Maya said, I'm Russell Callender. I'm one of the co-chairs of the task force. Lou Ann Thompson and I will be tag teaming this presentation. Lou Ann is the other co-chair. And this uh, report was a group effort with an incredible, passionate, and committed task force team and I'm going to do my very best to represent that work. My job today is really just to set the stage by outlining the charge to the task force and describe our approach to developing the report. Then Lou Ann will uh, walk through an overview of the report recommendations. We only have a few minutes to do this, so I would urge you to read the DEI task force report if you haven't. There's a link to the report in the invitation uh, to this meeting, or ask any of us. We could help you with that link. So in early November 2021, Interim Dean Hartman selected task force members from faculty, staff, and students within the college. He asked us, and I'm going to quote, to provide recommendations to incoming Dean Tolstoy for how the dean's office can support, coordinate, and sustain ongoing and future DEI efforts. He then asked us to do four very specific things. One is to take stock of the College of the Environment's current efforts. What are we doing? to assess our progress and consider how the Dean's Office can best support DEI efforts across the college. The third one was probably the biggest one, and that was to gather and synthesize input from across college units and departments. And finally, we needed to hurry up and get it done. We needed to get a report ready for Maya when she showed up uh, in January 2022. We were about three weeks late, but we still got it done. Um, since our task was based on an assessment of DEI-related work across the departments, we elected to develop a questionnaire uh, used to query each of the departments. There was a lot of discussion about what was the best way to do this and who in the departments would be asked to respond. And there, frankly, was no good scenario to do this, particularly in a short period of time. We wanted to make the questionnaire comprehensive but not overly burdensome so we would get useful responses and we'd get timely responses. We ultimately decided to send the questionnaires to the department heads and gave them flexibility in how they could respond, whether to answer it themselves, work with their DEI committee, or task others to respond. We fully realized that this approach was not perfect because the responses could potentially be biased by those in positions of power and authority, and we fully acknowledge that as a concern in the, in the report. Fundamentally, though, we thought that the the responses could still have value and would be the start of an energized and more comprehensive conversation in the college that we're kicking off today. We discussed the feasibility of developing a cross-college DEI culture survey to query everyone, faculty, staff, and students. But we ultimately decided that we, this approach really wasn't reasonable. We didn't have the expertise and we didn't have the time, I think, to do it right. The questions we ultimately developed were fairly broad and they were crafted to recognize the nuance and uniqueness of each department while making distinctions between academic and non-academic departments and different stakeholders, for example, faculty, staff, and students. We asked about specific activities such as whether departments had a DEI plan, whether they had dedicated DEI staffing, did they have DEI-based policies for recruitment, hiring, or retention. We asked about actions the departments are doing to create an inclusive community, and we also asked them more general comments about what could we do better as a, as a community. We also asked for recommendations on how the dean's office could help to support and move the entire college forward. And finally, we, we requested suggestions for addressing DEI leadership and support at the college level and asked for any big transformative ideas that can create a more welcome and inclusive environment in the college. 
The full list of questions are in the task force report, and I urge you to take a look at those. When we received the responses to the questionnaire, we condensed and synthesized all of them and compiled all existing department level policies and practice documents. We were very careful to not attribute verbatim responses in the report to any department or individual. I do want to note that sadly there were several responses to the questionnaire that chose culturally insensitive language. And what this did, though, is reinforce, reinforce the need for improved training and resources across the college. It's also clear that there is incredible DEI work being done within many individual departments, but, there, but these successes have not been effectively communicated or shared across the college. And personally, I, I feel that this is a missed opportunity. The report reinforces the need for us to learn from previous and existing work and to not reinvent the wheel and repeat mistakes of the past. So with that, let me pass the mic to Luann Thompson, who's going to walk us through some of the key recommendations. Luann? Thank you. Thank you. So I first want to reiterate my thanks to all the members of the task force. All of them were deeply involved in the creation of the report, and we did have challenging conversations at times in our meetings. But we came together to create a report that I believe we can be proud of, and I hope that it will make a difference. The report recommendations focus on ways in which the college as a whole can work together to create a diverse and inclusive committee, community, as well on uh, ways in which the Dean's Office can facilitate, support, and coordinate efforts across the college. The work of the task force shows how much is already being done while also showing how much more could be done with coordination and support. The report listed some activities that departments are currently taking to create an inclusive community, such as dedicated lecture series and efforts in co-learning, engagement, and community building. We also th synthesize efforts and procedures that departments are taking focused on faculty, student, and staff recruitment and retention, accountability, and outreach. We provided a list of 17 recommendations for college-wide activities on topics such as training, mentoring, mentoring mentorship programs, underrepresented minority postdoc to faculty pathways, student completion rates and advisor changes, transparencies in process, processes and practice, sharing best practices across the college, providing affinity spaces for people to gather, enhancing physical accessibility when it's not, um, when places are not accessible, and increasing um, minority serving institutions and underrepresented minority specific research experiences for undergraduates. A primary recommendation of the task force is for the dean's office to hire at the assistant or associate dean level. I understand the process is already beginning to find this person. This individual or potentially a group of individuals would be charged with coordinating and supporting efforts across units, balancing leading college-wide efforts while also facilitating change within the units. So I'll give a few examples of some of the things that this person could lead. This is not exhaustive or prescriptive, this person could collaboratively create a college-wide DEI strategic plan. They could establish relationships and meaningful connections with communities of color and tribal groups to promote respectful collaboration and co coordinate connections for further collaboration with minority-serving institutions and tribal colleges. Create a postdoc to faculty pathway to increase faculty diversity. Um, provide physical space for uh, affinity groups, support outreach efforts to public schools and with underserved populations, develop and implement existing policies to support equity in hiring, retention, and improvements in workplace culture, provide funding and advice for unit-level DEI initiatives while also encouraging collaboration and coordination across units, provide training in DEI topics for units, Coordinate college-wide mentoring programs for underrepresented members of the college at all levels, for example, faculty, staff, postdocs. Collect demographic data both within units and across the college, including information on degree completion. One final core recommendation of the report for, was for the college, along with all of its members, to find ways to celebrate diversity. A diversity of voices will enrich our scholarship and teaching and the kinds of research questions we ask. It is now my pleasure to introduce Ricky Hall. He is the Vice President for Minority Affairs and Diversity and University Diversity Officer at the UW, a role he has held since 2016. 
His office leads university's diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts and serves as a resource for the college and other units as they establish and assess their own diversity goals. Well, thank you, Luann, and thank you, Dean Tolstoy, and members of the DEI task force for the invitation to be with you today for this important discussion. A discussion which I believe is critical to the future success of the College of the Environment. As you might imagine, given my role, I'm a firm believer that diversity, equity, inclusion, and excellence are inextricably intertwined after interacting with Dean Toy Story it is clear to me that she too understands the importance of advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion within the college. I have been asked to talk briefly about the University of Washington's diversity blueprints and how it should inform the DEI work taking place in the college. Those of you who have been here at the institution for a while may recall that the first diversity blueprint was drafted in 2010 and was for the period 2010 through 2014. That document primarily focused on student and student issues. When I arrived in 2016, the university-wide diversity council had a draft of the second iteration of the blueprint. I added a goal, tweaked some of the language in that document, and then we set about rolling out the blueprint, which was for the years 2017 through uh, 2021. For nearly a year now, the university-wide diversity council has undertaken a process to revise and draft the new uh, blueprint, which will be for the years 2022 through 2026. We vetted the penultimate draft with governing bodies that represent the major constituencies. So um, our associate students of University of Washington across the three campuses, our board of deans um, and chancellors, um, the pro professional staff organization and others. We incorporated important feedback we heard and we will be doing a soft launch of the new diversity blueprint, which we're calling the diversity blueprint actions toward access, inclusion, and equity, and we'll be rolling that out um, soft lunch next, in the next week or so. In the fall, we will do a more formal launch of that document. So then, what is the diversity blueprint? The diversity blueprint outlines high-level aspirational goals for the tri-campus university community. It provides an overarching framework, and we are very intentional in calling it a, a framework. So it's an overarching framework for diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts rather than a specific plan for individual units. Individual units, both academic and administrative, are expected to design DEI strategic action plans in alignment with the broad goals of the blueprint. Many units across the university have done just that. And if you want to see a notable example of a DEI strategic action plan that aligns well with the diversity blueprint, take a look at the School of Nursing's plan. It's on, on their website. It is my hope that the College of the Environment will design a DEI action plan specific to its department and context, which aligns with the blueprint. The 2022 through 2026 version of the framework updates five of the six goals from the 2017-2021 blueprint. We renew and deepen our commitment to making the UW more accessible, welcoming, and equitable for students, staff, and academic personnel from diverse backgrounds, as well as our commitments to improving transparency and accountability. There is a new goal, and that new goal is to develop place-based education and engagement to advance access, inclusion, and equity. Our new goal challenges us to move beyond simply assessing diversity needs across our three campuses 
by calling on us to develop opportunities for place-based education and engagement. It is our hope that our new goal will challenge us to explore meaningful questions like, what does it mean for students, staff, and faculty to learn and work in specific places with specific histories? What does it mean for the university or even a college to rigorously explore their histories of racial, ethnic, and other exclusion? How can we enhance both a sense of belonging and a sense of responsibility by increasing our knowledge of our local and regional environments? Progress, as we well know, can be undeniably slow, especially for those of us who care deeply about issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. But change does and can occur when most of us are all pushing in the same direction. I'll end with a quote I posed in remarks I made at the Provost Town Hall a couple of years ago. I stated, the question we all should be asking is how do we accelerate change and ensure that in 10 years, students aren't raising the same issues and concerns that were raised in 1968, again in 2020, and also today in 2022. Thank you all again for the opportunity to be with you. I look forward to the important discussion that we're gonna be having. Thank you so much, Ricky, and thank you, uh, Luann and Russell as well. Um, and thank you for everyone for your hard work on these issues, and also thank you to Interim Dean Dennis Hartman, who convened the, the task force to begin with. As I said earlier, I think this report will serve as a good baseline point for our further work in the college. At the same time, I agree with the conclusions that we need to hear all voices, um, other than those uh, just of department chairs, directors, and other leaders in order to proceed um, as effectively as possible. In particular, I want to ensure that undergraduate, graduate students, staff, postdocs and early career faculty have an opportunity to share their thoughts, experiences, and ideas. Um, to that end, and specifically responding to the report, I would like to convene a comprehensive survey of our community regarding these issues to be conducted by an outside organization with experience in DEI issues. The last such survey was in 2016, and periodic surveys are, are a really important component of accountability. I'll share that information, the information on that process as it comes together, um, but I'm also thinking of today's discussion as a, as a step in that direction as well. Again, I encourage you to share your thoughts uh, at, when we open up to question in, in a few minutes, and uh, thank the many of you who've already submitted your questions. Before we do that, though, I'd like to talk about a few DEI initiatives that are already underway in the dean's office and within our units. Uh, some are well established and some just starting or in the planning stages in response to the report. First and foremost, uh, as, as Luann mentioned, we've already begun the uh, hiring process for an assistant or associate dean of diversity, equity, and inclusion at the college level. This individual will be part of the Dean's Office team who will ensure action and accountability, but will also work directly with our schools, departments, and other units to support DEI efforts at all levels. We envision this role growing to oversee a number of other staff who will further build out capacity on that front. But above all, this person should be a leader who helps make DEI relevant and impactful to, to who we are and what we do, and someone who serves as a resource and support for unit level efforts. The ad, which was framed by the task force recommendation, has been drafted and is currently out for feedback with the executive, council, uh, the executive committee, the college council, and the student advisory council, but we hope to post it very soon. Beyond recruiting a DEI leader, uh, the recommendations of the report fell broadly into four categories. Um, those are culture, recruitment, retention, and data. 
I want to give you a little bit of an update on uh, work already underway or planned within each category. So changing the, the culture of the college is perhaps the hardest of these goals to define and to measure, but one of the most critical. Uh, formal policies and procedures can build accountability into our operations, and positive change in the culture impacts day-to-day -day experiences of our community members and impact things like recruitment and retention in the long run. The approaches we're hoping to explore here include trainings at the college and unit level, creating and supporting existing affinity groups, and to more effectively share best practices throughout the college. We're also looking into the possibility of having our own college-wide professional conduct policy uh, like the UW School of Medicine has or like the American Geophysical Union has recently brought in. I'd also like all of these approaches to be informed by some of the more robust information that we plan to gather as part of our surveying process. Turning to recruitment and retention, we have a number of initiatives underway to help attract more diverse array of students and personnel. For instance, we offer a number of scholarships and undergraduate uh, research experiences which can help lower the financial burden of attending our college and provide robust skills that our graduates can carry forward into careers in the sciences. And we're home to programs such as Seattle Mesa, which supports underrepresented middle and high school students in STEM education as they prepare for college. The Doris Duke Con Conservation Scholars uh, Program to promote biocultural uh, conservation. And GeoDuck, a unique two-week immersive experience for incoming transfer students on board our research vessel and at our marine field facilities. We're also planning to allocate college resources to provide bridge support to hire faculty who contribute to the diversity of the college, allowing us to expand significantly the provost's program. My hope is that this will allow us to make a cohort hire of three to five faculty over the coming year that will contribute to building a diver more diverse faculty at the college. Finally, we've been working to build out our internal data collection processes so that we have a better sense of the current makeup of the college overall and so that we can more clearly uh, understand where we need to focus our efforts. This includes uh, tracking a number of key metrics, including demographics of our community members and progress through their academic careers. I'm grateful to those in our community who've already taken so many steps on this critical work. As we build up a staff in DEI, they will uh, further evaluate which of all these programs uh, might be expanded to other units and the college as a whole. And I don't want to pretend that I have all the answers here, but I can promise you I will do my best to use my position to advocate for and amplify the voices of underrepresented community members and to make sure that this work remains an utmost priority for the college. We have lots of work to do, but the report puts us in a stronger position to take it on together as a community. I'm going to open it up to questions now, which again can be submitted online uh, or through a comment card. And again, we are going to keep them on file both for myself and for the new ADDI. I want to note that we also received quite a number of questions uh, along similar lines beforehand, so we've combined some of them in the interest of time and in the hopes of being broadly applicable to everyone. And I'll just sit down now for the questions. All right, so I'm, is this live? Yes, okay, good. So. Um, I'm going to open with, with one question that we received, uh, or, or a theme of questions we received uh, beforehand, and that concerns the issue of speed and trust. So there are members of our community who feel that not enough has been done on DEI this far and indicate a lack of trust in the UW and in the college to address these issues. What can we do to speed things up and earn their trust? So I'm, I'm going to just uh, start out b before I um, ask the panel to, to comment on that by saying, first of all, I agree um, that we haven't done enough, and I, uh, I feel that sense of urgency as well. Um, 
So I, I wanted, to, wanted to say that, but I also want to recognize that systemic racism and other systemic oppressions have been with us for centuries, and um, so it's not going to change overnight. But I, I really feel, um, it com you know, being new to this community, I feel a remarkable energy in this community to affect change. And so I'm optimistic that with this new sense of urgency that we really uh, will be able to make change. Also in terms of building trust, I want to emphasize that I think accountability and transparency are really important. And so I will try to uh, keep that philosophy in everything I do. But let me pass it to the, to the panel. Would anybody like to start with that? I guess I'll just add that, um, you know, the commitment of the Dean's Office for a sustained effort is really crucial for this to, to really make change. And I hope that that example will also lead to units thinking strategically and long-term about the efforts that are within each unit and how they can sort of build off each other. Yeah. <clears throat> First, I'd say, and sorry, um, allergies, so I'm kind of losing my voice, but um, first thing for me is certainly about um, creating infrastructure and capacity to do the work, and it sounds like those plans are underway, um, both in terms of human and financial resources dedicated to this work that's tremendously um, important. And then next would be, um, just like uh, Maya talked about, um, transparency um, and accountability. I think those things are critical. And the third piece there is action. Um, and regularly reporting out what it is that you're doing, um, reporting um, your progress, you know, both the successes, but also um, things that haven't worked well. I think that's part of the process and people just wanna see that transparency. Well, you covered almost everything I was going to mention. Uh, I, I would say that I agree with all of that, and I absolutely agree with the urgency and the, what seems like a, a painfully slow uh, bit of progress. But I think measuring that progress as we move forward is, is key. I would really urge all of us to be forward-looking and to really be thinking about the future that we want to see here in the college and the future with each other. And I'm, I'm, I'm really hopeful that we can build that trust together if we approach it in a positive sort of forward-looking mindset. Thank you so much. Um, so another question that we received, so several uh, people noted that this report uh, heavily weighs the opinions of senior faculty and department heads. They ask how will we will ensure that other voices are heard. And, uh, you know, I've already mentioned uh, the, the survey that we want to do, and I know there's a certain amount of survey exhaustion, um, but I really want to encourage everyone to participate in that. It's a, it's a very important way, again, that we get a snapshot of what's going on in the community, but also to hold us accountable and to be able to track progress uh, through the years. So I, but I also want to, um, throw this to, to uh, Russell and Luann because I know that the committee itself was actually had, had uh, quite broad representation and you had difficult conversations. So could you talk a little bit about the process on, on the committee or on the task force? I'll start and then Luann can say what Russell meant to say was. Um, we'll see how that goes. I, <clears throat> this was a struggle in, in the task force. Uh, we really wanted to try to get the voice more broadly from each of the departments, um, but but frankly felt that that the stress of the time considerations and, and I and I know that sounds like a little bit of a cop out, but we tried to share with the department uh, chairs that they could respond. But it would be great if you engaged your DEI committee and it wasn't your voice coming in there. So it was done differently from unit or, or department to department, depending on how they wanted to approach it. And we recognize that. But again, as I said earlier, it still provided, I think, a lot of useful information. And yes, there were some biases in there. And yes, we need to figure out how to get broader voices into that, 
that conversation. But again, I think it was a start and it got us energized, which I think was key. Luann, you want to add to that? Yeah, it actually took up um, several meetings or more than several meetings discussing this issue because of really wanting to be comprehensive, but also acknowledging that we didn't have the experience or the resources to really do something that would be useful in the short amount of time. And we wanted to set up the College for Change. And, that, and so it seemed important to all of us that we did something that we could, you know, present to Maya and the, and the college leadership relatively early in her tenure. So I think that those tensions were active. And when I said there were difficult conversations, it was a lot of it was about this issue, about how to really hear from all the voices. And we did come to consensus about the approach. Um, so it was, it was an active part of our conversations. And the trade-offs, and in some sense, the disappointments of not being able to do that within the time and the expertise we had, um, those were really important conversations. Thank you. And, and uh, you know, I think this is a good example of uh, not, not letting the perfect be the enemy of, of the good, because this is, I mean, this is an enormously useful report for me, and I am really grateful to both of you for your leadership and to the whole task force. Again, um, I, you know, I realize that, that there are many other things that could have been done, but I think it's, it's always, um, there's always a tension in this work. There's so much to do um, that, that uh, you can always do more. And so at some point you have to say, okay, this is what we're doing at this stage and we will you know, continue to work and to do more. So I, I just really, uh, again, thank you guys for, for all your work on this. Um, let me move to another one. So uh, here's another question was, some faculty in my department have been resistant or actively opposed to DEI efforts. How do you plan to incentivize or uh, require commitment from faculty on these issues so that more progress can be made? Um, and so again, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this out to the group, but um, I want to say a few things on that. Uh, first of all, again, being relatively new here, I'm, I'm so impressed at the energy uh, here and the engagement across the board in, in these issues. And what I sense is that the vast majority of people really want to engage and want to do good in this area, but a lot of people struggle to know how. And so that's where I think, you know, building up this infrastructure that Ricky was talking about to help people and help make it easier for people to contribute is really important. That's not to say there are some, not a few people who do not want to engage in this work. And I, I think we should uh, keep in mind that we don't need everyone to engage to make progress. We can really make a lot of progress uh, together with the people who are engaged. So for the, for the panel, any thoughts on this? Sure. Um, challenging situation. Um, and while we would like everyone to be on board and have the same passion and commitment that uh, many of us here have, it's unlikely that that will happen. Um, and I, I, I think it's really important to recognize those who are doing good work. Um, and so um, I think so often we focus and concentrate on those who aren't with us. And um, I've taken an approach that um, let's really nurture and support those who are with us. Let's really work to create the climate environment for those folks to succeed. And as we're having successes, hopefully others will get on board um, and or maybe they will um, decide to leave um, um, the, the unit or, or the university um, in general. But in terms of recognition, uh, recognizing, I think it's important maybe perhaps consider, um, you can have some kind of college-wide um, event where you recognize both students, faculty, and staff who are really um, doing transformative work in this area um, as true champions for, for DEI. 
You may have also um, seen recently that the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, that announcement, I think it came out last week, that now for promotion and tenure, that all faculty will be required to submit um, statement of what they're doing in terms of DEI. I'm hoping that that will um, come here too and to other institutions across um, the, the United States. So I, I think those are some, some ways to, to really um, engage. Um, lastly, before I, I, I turn to these, to Russell and Luann, um, I think it's really important for directors, um, chairs, um, the deans also to be um, held accountable or to have to really talk about how they are um, resourcing DEI efforts. And just recently, actually this year for the first year in the budget review process with the president and provost, deans and VPs have to speak to how they are using their budgets to advance DEI. Um, and so I think that's huge. I think that, you know, and you will all be able to see that on the website. And you'll see clearly, you can see who's doing well and you can see who's really stretching things, really working really hard. And I, it might sound small, I trust me, you will see in years. Because when people have to report out in those ways, you will start to see change. And then lastly, if you really want to um, see change, start to tie it to merit review, uh, merit increase processes. Um, and be real serious about it. Um, all it takes is a star faculty member um, who's good in every other right, but they didn't get their full um, merit increase because um, they're not doing well on the DEI front. I, I can't really speak to efforts at the, <clears throat> the provost level or at the faculty level because I run a small non-academic department that it's, it's all staff, it's all professional staff. But what we've done is we've included in everyone's work plan a DEI element. And I was concerned that that would, I'd get a lot of pushback from the team and instead they embraced it, which I found incredibly exciting. And we have a, a 10 year DEI roadmap in Washington Sea Grant that we're all trying to push toward. So we have the plan, but we've also got that level of accountability at the work plan level. I think I'll just reiterate something I said before. In working on this report, it was amazing how many different things were going on in the college and how uncoordinated they were. And I think there's huge opportunities to make a difference by sharing and learning from each other about programs that could work. I mean, the small geoduct program is a collaboration across fisheries, oceanography, and marine biology, just kind of by chance that we wrote this NSF, relatively small NSF grant. But that kind of coordination, I think, can really make a difference. Great. Thank, thank you all for those thoughtful answers. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, read this question that I, that I just got, which uh, you know I'll answer, and it actually uh, feeds into the another question. So, um, exciting about the cluster hire. Uh, how will you allocate these hires across units? would you consider teaching professors for one or more of this cluster? So um, at this point, I'm not, I'm not uh, specifying how I would, how I would um, uh, allocate them across units. I'm asking units to uh, come up with their best candidates. And um, we, we're still ironing out how this process is, is uh, going to work. But I would like to see um, all the units come come forward with good candidates, and a number of the units have have active searches at the moment with very diverse pools, and so um, that will complement uh, this cluster hire as well. Um, so the the details of how we're doing this is is uh, are still being worked out. But I do want to see increased diversity across the units. And this may not be just a one-year thing. It, we might you know, repeat this the next year. It will depend on, on resources. But, I, but everyone needs to improve. That's clear. And 
the question about teaching professors, um, this, this cluster hire or cohort hire, as I'm talking about, because it's not going to be discipline specific, which is how many people think of a cluster hire, um, is, is specific to tenure track faculty, but absolutely I would consider providing resources to, um, to hire uh, teaching faculty that contribute to the diversity of the college. Um, and with that, I'm going to move into uh, the next question, one of the questions we got beforehand, which is how do you uh, go about aggressively working to diversify our community when we are limited by Initiative 200, which uh, banned affirmative action? And uh, again, I'm new to the state. Uh, my understanding is we can hire faculty uh, or uh, anyone based on uh, them contributing to the diversity of the college, but not based on their specific race or ethnicity. But I'm going to hand this one over to Ricky, who can give me a much more sophisticated <laughs> No, I don't know <laughs> how sophisticated. But uh, you're precisely right. We can't make um, admissions or hiring decisions based on race or gender but I think some people really use this to hide behind. And, and I say that too, so when I hear that, I'm gonna tell folks, if you're saying you're a champion and that's the first thing I hear from you, I really question that. I mean, because I think people who really are champions, you, you, you walk right up to the line, you know, let somebody tell you that you're violating it. That, that's kind of my, my stance and where I come. But it's really about not making um, admissions or hiring decisions, but because you can't, Precisely because you, because you can't, you should be really, it really actually encourages you to be aggressive in your outreach activities, including being able to do targeted um, recruitment um, for specific populations, including underrepresented populations. And I hear people say that we can't, we absolutely can, and you should because you want to have those diverse pools. Since you can't, you just can't make the decisions. Um, based on race or gender. And some of you all may have seen that um, in January, um, Governor Inslee um, rescind, rescinded um, Order 98-01, I think, um, which gave guidance for I-200 for state agencies. Now, that, um, when he rescinded, and we put in new guidance, because um, he thought that what was there was too restrictive, that doesn't apply to higher education right now. However, we are really hopeful because we expect this fall that there will be some guidance um, around um, state HR related issues, which we think will also apply to the university, or at least we hope to, and then we'll get maybe at some of these other issues um, and maybe even um, open the door for us to be even more aggressive when it comes to recruiting underrepresented populations. Thank you very much. All right, another um, tough question that we, that we received uh, beforehand. How will you hold tenured faculty accountable if they refuse to change problematic behavior? It's a good question. Um, and, and, you know, again, most of my experience in, in this is at a previous institution, but I can, I can talk about sort of the general themes. And, and you know, one of, the, one of the problems is when you have a formal complaint, um, there, there are privacy issues. And so even when you are holding somebody accountable, you can't always tell people about it. So very often the things that are happening are happening in, in a confidential setting. Um, I think uh, the other thing that you can, I mean, specific things that you can do is, uh, for instance, if you have uh, s somebody who's repeatedly uh, harassing or uh, causing problems with graduate students, you can stop them from being allowed to have more graduate students. You can also um, find people non-meritorious in their uh, annual review, which means you can freeze their salary so they don't get a pay raise. So those are some of the tools that, that we have for holding people accountable. But it is, a, you know, it is a challenge across uh, institutions. This is not unique to UW. But Ricky, maybe do you have anything more to say about 
about how things work here? I, I think you, you said, you know, kind of important things. I think where the frustration comes again is that lack of transparency, um, because often there are things happening behind the scenes. Um, I often, because I, I tell people, because sometimes people will share what their beliefs are, and I have these conversations because of their beliefs based on religion or something. So, okay, your beliefs are your beliefs. However, um, and, and I can't change that, and I'm not going to sit and debate with folks. It's not the best use of my time these days. But what I look at is for behaviors. And I was like, there are certain behaviors that will not be tolerated um, in this setting. So you can believe what you want to believe, um, but if that leads to discriminatory or biased uh, behaviors, those are things that we can engage. Um, those are things that um, we can take some action on. However, as, as Maya talked about, um, it, a lot of that is private because it's personal issues and it takes a long time sometimes. And so I want to be transparent about that and that could be frustrating to folks. So if you go to our uh, compliance area um, um, and, and make a complaint, that's one way um, for to make complaints against faculty and staff, but there's a process. There's an in investigation that takes place um, that sometimes can take a, a bit of time. And then um, after um, that is resolved, um, the only folks that know are um, probably um, the complainant, um, the, the person who um, the charge was brought against, and then maybe, um, depending on what it is, their, their supervisor, so it's very, um, challenging um, um, because of all the things that, that um, Maya talked about. One of the things I have um, been in discussions with our compliance areas about, even though we can't talk about specifics, that some reporting in an aggregate over a year, but we got these many kind of complaints, and these are the types of actions that were taken. So there's not linked to an individual, but at least people see or get an understanding that things do happen. You might not know that it specifically happened, but they do happen. Great, thank you so much. I think, you know, one other thing that I, I uh, want to reinforce also is the need to file a formal complaint. And so um, very often people think just because they've sort of raised the issue that something should be done, but to take serious personnel actions there needs to be a formal, a formal complaint um, of some sort. Uh, all right, so another great question here. Uh, could the plan survey include former community members? People have left because we haven't made them feel supported or included. I think that's a really important point. Um, in previous uh, survey work that I did at my former institution, some of our most valuable uh, interview data came from people who were leaving um, and and but you know we also looked at the at the demographics of people who left versus people who hadn't left and that was also infor informative uh, the problem can be it's very hard to uh, track down those people now for alumni who have graduated it might be a little easier and and so I can certainly see it, it might be easier to include alumni, but if somebody left before finishing, then it becomes a little more difficult. Do you guys have any thoughts on this? I guess I have a question. Is there is there a, any mandated series of exit interviews that take place, or is there a mechanism to do that? Like, we do that somewhat informally, because people, when they're leaving, really don't have anything to lose by telling you. Um, but like, yeah. is there anything more formal to get that, you know, get those data? The, the person who I know could answer that, I, I saw I had to leave shortly. <laughs> okay, I, know, I know we do exit interviews within the dean's office. Um, I'm not actually sure. That's part of my newness. Ricky, do you know? I'm just gonna say, hey, I'm a fan of exit interviews, um, both when um, people leave um, to try to get a sense at what, but I, I, they should be real exit interviews because sometimes I think people, they ask questions and it's a way later when you're engaging with folks and it's like, well, it said this and they're re and it's all these excuses except for really what's really at the heart of why people are leaving. I hear all of this, well, they wanted more money and it's like, um, um, they wouldn't have even been looking if they weren't having a challenging situation. And I know that because they were in my office, you know. Yeah. So 
Um, so really thinking through um, the questions and who's asking those questions. The other thing is, um, if possible, then engaging those people six to nine months later. Because I often seen too, depending on, especially those folks who have really had a horrendous time or experience or traumatized in some way, when they're leaving, they often won't engage or they just want to be gone. They just want to be gone, and they're not willing to tell you the real at that point in time. But sometimes if you engage them later, then they're um, willing to share more um, about really what was transpiring that led to them leaving in the first place. That's such a good point. Thank you. Anything? Any, did you have something else to add? Sorry, as a panelist, I asked a question that I didn't have a card for. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I'd say that the graduate school does do exit interviews, but I don't think they're comprehensive. Okay. I, yeah, I really like the point about waiting some period of time as well. Um, all right, let me see. Uh, an, uh, another question, how do we get more people involved in DEI efforts? Right now, it is all done by the overburdened few. Um, I think that goes back a little bit also to uh, to people knowing what to do, but also to recognizing and rewarding and supporting the EI work. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? We could probably go on for a long time on this one. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it is a concern, you know, and I've I've heard it over and over. I've seen it over and over. I've as a department chair, I've I've actually keep pinging on the same people. And so I think the best thing to do is to try to make it, DI activities not the separate thing on the side, but integral to all that you're doing so that it's it's incorporated into everything. It's incorporated into mm -hmm. into your hiring process. Like we incorporate it into the, the research that we fund or the fellowships we support. So I would just, you know, look for opportunities to, to integrate it into everything so that it's part of the fabric. Yeah. I just wanted to add that a lot of the energy and work on these issues is often by students. So really understanding how we can support them in their work, um, listen to them, and also sustain what what they're working on. So because um, you know, particularly if it's a junior or senior undergraduate, you know, they'll graduate and leave. Um, or graduate students who have their own timelines, but I think I don't have an answer of how to do that, but it's an important community that is really working very hard at this point. Thank you. Um, all right, this is going to be the, the last question. This, this one's for, for Ricky. Um, what can the college learn from other UW units, and how can your office support us? I think that's a great question. Um, what's great about um, being at this university um, when it comes to this work, and hear me, we're nowhere perfect. We have a long way to go. Um, and we do have some good things in place. Um, and, and one of those, uh, one of the things that I really appreciate, um, and there were a few positions when I got here, but since I've been here, almost every college and school has a DEI lead, so an associate dean or um, assistant dean of DEI. In addition, what we've seen now is many administrative units. So like um, athletics has an associate AD for DEI. Um, advancement has a DEI lead. Um, I know that some other major administrative areas are looking at, and so, um, it's a cluster of folks that are doing good work across the university, and I bring those folks together. We have these DEI leads meetings um, periodically, and um, to, to share, um, to vent. Um, uh, so um, um, it's becoming a, a community of practice. Um, but there are many folks, like I talked about School of Nursing, their plan, really look at it. And again, the difference from framework and a plan, you can see. It's because we have these for the diversity blueprint over broad overarching um, goals and they have to be so that every college school can see themselves in it, right? But with the action plans, then you can see the specific um, who's accountable, by when, 
all of those things, and nursing does a, a great job. So that's an example of connecting with a unit that's doing good work. There are other units are across the university that is doing uh, good work when it comes to um, DEI education and training. Um, so um, medicine has a number of um, trainings underway. Um, I know um, that you all work a lot um, with um, folks in the, the health sciences as well. So um, they'd be a good partner, one to look at, especially when it comes to um, the education and training that's taken place. Um, and there's others, and, and I can go on and on, because there, there's a lot of great work taking place at, at the university, and I do think it's important to reach out to learn um, and also um, to aspire. You know, what I would love to hear, um, and, uh, and I think Maya is getting there, I want to hear that the College of, of, the College of Environment wants to be the model for how you do DI in this type of college. You want to be the national model for this type of work and this type of unit. And that's where I think we all should be striving to be. Thank you so much for that um, very thoughtful and aspirational <laughs> um, re response. And, and I agree. And, and again, I, I have this uh, advantage of coming from a, from a different institution. And so um, while I know there's still a lot of work to be done, I was actually attracted to UW and to the College of the Environment in, in part because of the extraordinary energy uh, and commitment around DEI work, and it really is palpable here. Um, so I, I am optimistic that we can become that, that model uh, for other institutions and other uh, environmental science uh, uh, colleges across the country. Um, I want to uh, thank the panelists for uh, all your thoughtful contributions, your ideas, all your hard work on this topic, for taking the time to be here and to, and to prepare to be here today. I really appreciate it. Um, I also uh, particularly want to thank uh, three people who helped support this event. This, it, it looks kind of uh, like it just all happens by itself. But uh, the MARCOM team has been really uh, essential in helping set this up and helping plan this, particularly Molly McCarthy and Will Shenton, and um, also uh, Monica Cataldo from, uh, from Advancement who helped with organizing this. This is a lot of work that goes into making these events uh, function smoothly. And to the whole UW team who's doing the, the videoing uh, or the camera work back there, thank you as well to you. And finally, thank you to, uh, to you, the audience, for, for coming, for listening, for engaging, for your great questions. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, but I'm very optimistic that we can make real progress. So thank you. Thank you.